layer and then we can make multiple layers and we can somehow print a solid object. Um, and he, but he thought about it, it was really more of a, an academic exercise. In 1984, there were uh, three Frenchmen that actually patented the idea and then let the patent lapse because they did not see a commercial application for it. Um, Chuck Hall, 1987, is the guy that actually created the first uh, 3D printer, and this is now in a, a, a museum. And one of the things that, that, that Hall did was he also invented this language format to describe 3D objects, and that's the uh, standard tessellation language, STL format, that is in the little tone box in the upper right. And this is something that you're going to run into uh, time and time again. This has been around since the, the very beginning. Uh, moving down lines, uh, this FDM uh, acronym, that's something that you're going to see. That's fused deposition modeling. And that's the, the type of, of, of uh, 3D printing where you extrude melted plastic and you build up layers with that. If you've seen the images of people 3D printing houses, that's basically you know, out of yeah, you know, concrete coming out of a tube. That's the same basic principle. Uh, and that was uh, first patented in 1992. All throughout this period between 92 and 2009, there were a lot of commercial applications. I did some work uh, for the Air Force in the, uh, the uh, 2000 to 2003 timeframe that where we had uh, Boeing out in St. Louis, 3D printed aircraft uh, models for us to our specifications to do subscale wind tunnel testing. And so, you know, we were using it uh, in, in anger to do work back then, but, it would all stayed industrial because that's just because you know all of the the uh, the machines that were building all of these things were all subject to these patents that were done filed in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. 2009, those uh, first patents began to exp uh, expire, and this is when MakerBot built its first uh, yeah home use uh, uh, 3D printer. This is a kit. It comes, you know, it's, it, it, uh, you, know, you have to do all the, ele the electronics and the, the mechanics and the case and everything else uh, was like that. And that was the first FDM printer. The first uh, resin-based printer came along in 2012. 2014 is the really important year here because this is when that key uh, stereo lift uh, patent expired. And then you saw the explosion of all of these uh, desktop units that we're seeing now. And now and now in 2021, you can get a 3D printer and put it on your desktop and it's less than $200. Now, you know, $200 is a sizable investment, but when you think about how much money you spend on detail castings over the years um, and what you have spent on the other tools in your toolbox, uh, $200 for the things that this thing can do, I think is a very reasonable investment. So there's but two basic 3D printer types, and we mentioned both of them in the last slide. The, the first one here that we'll talk about is a fused deposition modeling. And, and what it does is it's got these filament spools, and these are plastics, different mechanical properties, but basically it's a flexible plastic that feeds through a print head. This print head comes in, it heats it up. This is the print head here, it heats it up. This axis, this uh, stepper motors here move it along the X axis and Y axis. And there's a frame on the side that you can't, that's not shown here that moves it up and down. It comes down here, it heats up the plastic and then it just, this thing moves back and forth up and down to create the 3D model. The SLA printer, which is on the left works fundamentally differently. And so what that has is there's a, a vat of resin sitting right here and at the bottom of this vat of resin, there's a piece of clear film. Underneath, there's a high powered uh, LED and it, it runs through a condenser. And then what happens is it passes through a, a liquid crystal diode screen. But what this does is it forms a mask which blocks out the LED light. It's very similar to um, uh, doing photo resist uh, photo etching for brass. It works basically on the same principle. So the LED shines through the mask. It, it uh, exposes the layer of resin right here. The support base then lifts up, allows more resin to get in underneath, 
drops back down and then you do the next layer and it just works its way up and creates the model. Well, the strengths and weak, they, they, each one of them has different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, if you want something that has actually decent mechanical properties and it, you need to go to the, uh, the FDM type printer. Um, they both, you can get colored film for, uh, colored uh, filament for this. And some, some of the, uh, the models have actually uh, feed two different colors of filament. So you can switch back and forth depending upon what you want to do. Uh, there's different colors of resin that you can get here. Uh, you know, all different colors, translucents uh, and, and various things. Uh, the material options, uh, again, you can get like uh, wood grain based filaments here. You can get uh, uh, different mechanical properties here. Uh, so again, there's, there's some different options here. The FDM printers tend to be bigger on average. Uh, you know, you, you uh, can print very large objects here. The downside is you give up resolution. And that's where these, these, uh, these resin printers really uh, shine is the ability to get high resolution uh, images and high uh, resolution parts out of them. The newer generation, especially, the print speed is in favor of the SLA printers. The downside, again, is uh, these things, because it's a liquid, uh, because that liquid is relatively caustic, uh, you know, you've got gloves and funnels and filters and bottles of stuff, as opposed to just putting a, a spool of filament on here. And so in terms of you know, how messy it is, that's definitely on the, on the, the side of the FDM printer. However, if what you're after is resolution and as modelers, we're trying to get as fine a detail as possible, that really everything else aside, that really throws the, uh, the uh, balance in favor of the SLA printer. And this is the kind of the, the trade-off that I went through last summer as I was trying to figure out, okay, I want to, I want to get into this, but what kind of printer should I get? This is, this is how that uh, worked out for me. If you go to, uh, uh, and there's a, I'll reference this later, uh, all, all3dp.com is a, is a great all source um, place for, for finding out information about uh, printers and 3D printing in general. Um, but these are, these, are, these are what they consider to be the best 3D printers out there. And some of them are very expensive. You can see they're you know, you know, $1,400, $1,400, $2,000. But these down here from the Elegu Mars on down, uh, relatively inexpensive. Uh, you can see uh, several, uh, th this one is under listed under 200 here. And actually there's others on this list that are also not on this list that are under 200 as well. But um, uh, the big companies are Elegu, Creality, uh, Frozen uh, makes some very nice printers and uh, Anycubic. Um, are, are really the major players in the SLA market. And the one that I ended up, I actually have two. Um, and, the, and the reason for that, I'll just take a, a quick detour, is I bought a, uh, an Anycubic Photon uh, last July. And these are all made in China. The companies are all based in China. Their websites are all native, yeah, native Chinese. If you get an email from them, it's always in Chinese with an English translation. And what I discovered this year is that if you are really just out of luck if your printer breaks during Chinese New Year. And so I, my my photon went out. I had gotten a risen a drip down. It got onto the, uh, the the control screen here, and the control screen would no longer work. They're more than happy to work with you if they're in the office, but Chinese New Year goes on for three weeks. And of course, this thing broke at the beginning of Chinese New Year. And I'm sitting there saying, okay, I'm going to wait three weeks for them to get back in the office. And it's another two weeks for them to send me a new screen. And I just said, screw it. And I went out and bought a new Creality LD002H. And that's the one machine that we're going to talk about today uh, that I that's become my workhorse. And there's, there's a reason for that. Um, and, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. We'll, we'll just skip over that. But there's a reason for, for going uh, with this new technology. 
Now, the dirty secret that nobody tells you when you're first getting into 3D printing is like, oh, cool, I've got this 3D printer. I'm going to do some amazing things. And it, it's only part of the process. And this is, this is uh, the thing that people say, oh, okay. Because the first thing I need to do is I need to get a model. I need to either build that model myself or I need to get download it from somewhere online. Uh, and I still can't get it to the printer because then I need to, you know, this is a 3D model. It comes in that STL format, but I can't use an STL format directly in the printer. I first have to create, remember we talked about how those, those layers are created and necessary in order to break the model down. And that's where this, I got a computer with a mind of its own. And that's where this software here that's called a slicer fits in. And what that does is it takes the, the model that you have and it basically it creates all of those horizontal 2D slices that the printer uses to build the model up. That, uh, and that it, it writes that, that sliced file, that goes to the printer. But even after that, remember I mentioned the resin, uh, you need to wash that resin off. You don't want to do that in the sink because the resin is, is fairly uh, toxic. I mean, it's not, you know, and uh, so what you'll do is you'll wash it off and then it's photo, it's a uh, photo cured with UV light. You only get a partial cure here. You wash it off here and then you do the final curing. You can do either do it in a machine like this or you can do it uh, with something that's homemade. There's different options. Uh, you know, worst case scenario, if you want to cure it, you can put it on your windowsill and let the sunlight do it for you. So building the model, uh, and, and I'm not gonna get into uh, the specifics of CAD modeling or, or, or everything, or a lot of detail on this, but I just wanna make sure that you're aware of it and what some of the options are. To do the customized parts that we will typically wanna do, and whether that's a, a custom window size or a locomotive or a truck or any, any specific part that we might want, you're going to want to learn how to use a CAD program. Now, all of the programs that I'm showing on this screen are free. Uh, you can go, you can do a search for them, you can download them, you can install them. But with any, like with any tool, you know, they're not terribly useful until you really understand how, how to use them. And so uh, this, this uh, Tinkercad is yeah, free. The one I use is uh, Fusion 360. That's from Autodesk, the people that make AutoCAD and, and, and things like that. Uh, really, really powerful. And there is a free version for personal use. Uh, Google SketchUp has now become just SketchUp and that's, that's available for free. And these top three are all really good for doing mechanical drawings and mechanical things. So locomotives and trucks and cars and gears and things like that. Down here, if you want to do uh, anything that's kind of an organic thing, so figures and uh, animals or, or things like that, that's when you want to try to get down into these blender and mesh mixer. And again, these are all free. They're, they're, you can go in and you can download them. The best thing you can do after this is just get in it and play with it. And there's a lot of YouTube tutorials out there that you can use to get familiar with these. And, and when, I, uh, uh, when I downloaded Fusion, I've got a, a secondary monitor that I use with my laptop and I just put uh, the tutorial on one monitor and Fusion opened up Fusion on the other monitor and then just kind of followed along uh, to learn how to do it. Alternatively, there's a lot of free download sites. And the, 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 the first one that I explored is Thingiverse. And this is the one that's been around the longest. This is something that MakerBot came up with back in the, the uh, yeah, 2009-ish timeframe. So it's been around for a while. And uh, it's got a search in engine in there, so you can go in and you can look for uh, automobiles. You can look for uh, just put train in there; it'll come up with one. And a lot of these things are toys, but there's some scale stuff in there too, and there there's some really good pieces. But there's so much in there; I don't think it's really terribly well indexed, uh, and so you sometimes need to search to find what you're looking for. And that's really kind of the the truth for all of these things, and they all have different um, different models in them. Uh, they're not, yeah, they're, they're sometimes there's a duplication, but not always. What I have discovered is if you go in uh, into Google and just search uh, 
free STL download and then whatever the other thing, yeah, yeah, train, car, whatever, yeah, fireman helmet, you know, you can fairly quickly find out whether or not there's something that uh, fits the bill for what you're looking for. Um, so, Ray, um, yeah, um, David McMullen has a question he'd like to ask. Sure. That would be a good point to ask that. Yeah, Ray, could you just briefly uh, give us some pros and cons between those three uh, uh, design programs? I've worked in SketchUp, and I'm familiar with that, but can you tell us a little comparative between the Fusion and the uh, Tinkercad and SketchUp? The short answer is no. Uh, okay. Because the only one I've used is Fusion. Okay. I do know that those are out there. Um, I, I've considered playing around because uh, I've considered playing around with SketchUp because I've actually got a version of that as well. But to be honest, uh, Fusion is just so powerful and can do so many things, uh, and and is free. Uh, I never felt that the after I got comfortable with it, you know, I was kind of afraid to go and explore one of those other ones because now I'm at the bad end of the learning. So it's, it's uh, but again, as long as you're able to to do the things that you want to do, be able to uh, create, uh, you know, patterns of rivets as an as a, as an example, uh, create one half of a car and then mirror, mirror it, uh, you know, those kinds of things. I don't think it honestly matters a whole lot which one of those you use. How is the learning curve? For Fusion, I didn't find it too bad, but I've got an engineering background. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I basically fell back on the you know, mechanical drawing uh, training that I had you know, 30 years ago. And so from, from that perspective, it wasn't too bad. Now, what the, the interesting thing was, again, you know, the old mechanical drawing stuff when you were sitting there with mylar and, and, and paper and, you know, and T-squares and things, uh, it's obviously a 2D object. And what I found interesting was the learning process to go from the 2D object to the 3D object. Uh, and, and let's take a, a window for an ex as an example. You can um, build that in a number of different ways. Uh, just thinking about the sash, do you build up the sash with the individual uh, mullion components, uh, horizontal and, and vertical? and then put a frame around it? Or do you start with a flat slab and then cut the openings out? Uh, I mean, you end up at the same place, but you know, which, which one is easier, which one is more intuitive? And so there, there's probably as many ways to do this as there are people doing it. Uh, it it's really, again, it's, a, it's like any other skill set. The, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Thank you. Uh, and, and the same thing, you know, again, the same thing applies with uh, doing these searches for these models. You know, you, you, you learn what search patterns work, which ones don't, uh, and, and how, how the different sites work. Again, uh, I use TurboSquid occasionally. Most of the times I'll go to Thingiverse is, is the first thing. Uh, CG Trader and Cult3D uh, I use fairly regularly, but not as often as I use Thingiverse. Thingiverse is, is my, my first stop, is to see if there's something there. Um, OK, so the slicers, I mentioned what it does is it creates a horizontal pattern. Again, they're just like there's lots of different uh, software out there for do, building the, the CAD models, just like there's lots of different search engines out there for pre-existing models. Uh, there's a lot of different slicers there. And they these really do. Um, a number of things. Uh, the first is you can combine different models and put them on the, the same work pad. So I've, I've done a lot of things where I've done a, a row of uh, fire height, you know, like as an example, a row of fire hydrants and then a row of fire alarm boxes and then a row of firemen helmets and things like that. So you can do multiple things uh, along those lines. One of the, the things that you will see frequently is the orientation of these uh, will be changed. Uh, you don't typically print something flat on the surface. And the reason for that is you get a, a phenomenon called elephant's foot, 
which is because the, the initial layers uh, are exposed longer to make sure that they adhere to the print bed, the, the light tends to spread out and you get a little flare at the, at the bottom at the print head. So what you'll do is, is lift them off the print base. Yeah, usually five millimeters is enough. You can see the little pads here uh, that represent the, uh, the adhesions to the, uh, the print bed. And then you've got these uh, structures and supports that actually support the model as it's being printed. Because it's uh, printed in layers, you need to be careful about uh, making sure that the first bit of this that touches the, uh, the print bed has, has got a support on it. And then gradually support it up the edge because it'll so if you you're going up here, you can do a little bit here and then a little bit more here and a little bit more here on the next layer. But if there's too much of a, a difference there, you'll lose the support on the edges and uh, the print won't work properly. Uh, again, this is one of those things where the more you do it, the better you get at it. You begin to get a feel for where you need to put a support. Uh, Chi2 Box and, and Lychee Slicer in particular are really, really good at doing automatic support. Uh, they tend to over support, but yeah, and, and you can do a better job yourself. But if you, you don't know what you're doing and initially nobody knows what they're doing, using the automatic supports, especially in Chi2 Box, um, is not a bad way to go. So the, 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 the slicers will also allow you to set the parameters for your print. So the, the, the layer depth and, and these printers will go, uh, depending on the printer, anywhere from uh, 10 microns up to 50 microns. And when I say that, yeah, so 10 microns is uh, one one hundredth of a millimeter. That's the, that's the level of resolution some of these printers are going at, uh, which is just mind boggling. Um, the number of bottom layers, that's how many layers are here at this first level, and that it helps you adhere to the print bed. Uh, the exposure time, I mentioned the bottom layers are exposed for longer than the upper ones. Uh, the lift speed um, as well. Actually, you know what, I'm, I'm going to talk about all these in the next slide, so I'm not going to go on uh, anymore at this point. Uh, I've already probably said too much on this slide. But again, these are all free. Um, I personally, it started out, uh, my original uh, 3D printer was a, uh, was a uh, Anycubic Photon. They come with their own slicer software. Uh, and I actually found relatively quickly is that the supports that I got out of Chi2 Box worked much better than the ones that came out of the uh, Anycubic slicer. And so I, I switched over to this fairly quickly. I do have a copy of Lychee Slicer uh, as well, but I've not really played around with it a lot. I've heard very, very good things about the Prusa slicer. Uh, I've got several friends that have uh, uh, Prusa uh, FDM printers and they really, really like the way that this works. I mentioned the slicer settings and the, these, are, these are what they all do. So if you look at the, the, uh, the layer height, this is the difference between uh, 100 micron mic layers and a 50 mic layer. And you can see the stair stepping is what happens uh, as you get uh, finer and finer uh, layers, you get much better surfaces. The exposure time, uh, overexposed uh, holes tend to fill in. Um, it, 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 they, uh, you lose the, the crispness of the print. Uh, if you're underexposed, uh, some of those smaller parts uh, just simply don't print at all. And again, it depends on the machine that you have depends on the type of resin that you, you use. And these images here, these are actually a, a uh, test print that you can use to help dial it in. And you can see that the guy that did this, uh, 1.5 second exposure, 2.5 second, 3.5 second, just trying to figure out which worked best. And some of these, uh, the newer printers, you're actually talking tenths of a second uh, for the exposure, trying to get these dialed in to get the best results. And again, it's just a matter of experimentation. Uh, go through, run it, run it at these different things. And then, okay, well, I know this is overexposed. This is underexposed. This is pretty good. And so I might try, I might do 1.8 and 2.8 just to see whether or not I might want to be somewhere in the middle here. And again, you can just kind of dial it in doing that way. 
and again, this is for a particular printer for a particular resin type. And having done that, you write those those um, those figures down, and that's what you you save. And and the slicers will actually allow you to save these settings for different types of resin. So it becomes really easy. You just go in, you pull, go to the pull down menu, you pull up the resin, and that gives you the settings that you know work well with your printer. Let's see uh, when when you uh, you print the layer and then it lifts up, and then you you know to get the resin back in, and then you lift down. But what happens is this this uh, film uh, it's called a, a FAP, and I don't recall what that means, but this film uh, has a tension to it, and you'll, it'll pull away. Uh, and if there's too much tension, you see this delamination, and you can dial you can dial that down. You can help get rid of this just by slowing the lift speed down. And again, this is one of those things where you can play around with it. The, the safe thing to do is to make the lift speed very slow, but that slows down your print time. It's, again, it's a trade-off. I mentioned uh, the part orientation uh, earlier. Anti-aliasing is something that I haven't talked about. And remember I talked earlier on about how the, the exposure is done by virtue of masking an LED light. Um, but it doesn't, that mask doesn't have to be, it's, it's done in pixels, but it doesn't have to be on or off. You can do a grayscale in there as well. And what that does is allows you to, again, to get much finer detail uh, using anti-aliasing than it is black and white. Again, it's, it's, it's a, you gotta be careful with it because in some cases you might lose detail. What if you want this kind of stair step detail a grayscale may wash that out. So you need to be careful about using this. Um, but it, it's a very powerful thing you can use to for smooth surfaces. Okay, now we've, we've got the model, we've sliced it, now it's time to print. And I mentioned that this resin is, is fairly caustic. So uh, buy nitrile gloves, buy the case. Um, the resins, uh, again, this is from uh, the, a, a different uh, site, uh, Windows Central, they, their take on what the best resins are. And the, the, the thing that I want to point out here is there are a lot of different resins. What I will typically do is I use one uh, from Elegoo, which is uh, the one mentioned here. But the one I use is something that's an AB, called ABS-like. It's not, it's not it's styrene resin, uh, it's, it, it is a resin, but it does have mechanical properties that are closer to styrene than most, some of the others. One of the, one of the problems with doing the resin printing is it can be very brittle uh, and going with the ABS-like helps, uh, helps with that somewhat. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons I went to that. And there are, you know, and again, if you go in and you get into this in a serious way, uh, I see a lot of things from people who print miniatures where they will mix their own resins. They'll use, you know, eight parts this with two parts this with one part this. Uh, this this um, Ceratech uh, is something uh, something that a lot of people really like because that helps uh, a lot with the mechanical properties of it. Um, and this is what it looks like here as as it's printed. So you you you've uh, yeah, it comes down. You can see these are the base layers that I talked about. Here are the supports, and here's the, the beginning of a floor for a passenger car. So I, I mentioned that there was some newer technology out there, and in the, the nine months from last July, and that wasn't even nine months, I brought, bought the, the, uh, the Photon in July of last year. Chinese New Year was the uh, 12th of February this year. And I know that because my printer broke on the 12th of February. Um, and, and so I, that's when I went out and I bought the, the new Creality machine. But one of the reasons I was able to justify in my own head, you know, rationalization being uh, the key to, to a lot of our decision making is that the older machines used a full, full color LEDs. The newer ones use monochromatic ones. And why that's important is that rather than putting a power into three different light spectrums, you're putting it into a single one, which means you're able to get much more power out of it, which means you have a lot faster print. 
So uh, not on here, the, 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 you saw the, uh, the colored covers uh, in, in some of the earlier pictures, but normally there's a colored cover that sits on top of this. And that is to uh, protect from uh, UV light uh, from penetrating. Best to use it in a room with, with very little direct sunlight best, uh, and good ventilation because yeah, the resin does have fumes. Um, but this is, this is kind of what you might see. So it's where we are here. So you can see it raising up there. It's done the print. Now it's going to lower back down to do the next exposure. And it takes about two seconds and then it's off. Now this little, listen, did you hear that little uh, flap there? We'll, we'll run it back again. That is the uh, sound of the model pulling away from that film. You know, I mentioned that there's a certain amount of tension that you get there. And so that's, that's what that sounds like. And, and you're not expecting it, it can be a little bit unnerving because it does that for however many layers you're printing. And if you're printing a large model like this one, this, this is something like, you know, yeah, 4,000 layers or something along those lines. One of the downsides of the resin printer is because this is an anodized uh, aluminum vat, um, until you've been printing for an hour, you can't really see what's going on because the vat covers all of the, uh, the progress. So you have to kind of trust it and fate, and it isn't until you get to this point and you say, okay, yeah, my uh, all of my uh, supports adhered properly, my supports are printing properly, and I can see the beginning of my object. This is when you can start feeling pretty good that, yeah, this is going to print out okay. After it's all done, you, you need to wash the, the excess resin off. And all of the major manufacturers have built something like this. This is a wash and cure machine. And, and what it does is uh, there is a, a bat that sits in here with a little uh, impeller here, and it just churns a vat of isopropyl alcohol around the part, and it washes the part off. Um, I've only got the one vat. It's pretty nasty. Usually what the, you, know, the, you would like to do is to have basically a dirty wash and a clean wash, so you get most of the, the, the gunk off of the first one, and then you do a second one to do that. Actually, what I am do, do is I, I have this thing that does my dirty wash, and then I have a uh, a, an ultrasonic jewelry cleaner filled with like alcohol that I use to do the second one. Um, then I go ahead and wash it off with water, let it dry, and then you can uh, put it in this. And this this is a string of uh, 405 nanometer uh, LEDs, and this will help. This will go through and finish the curing process. Um, you can do it cheaper. You can hand wash it. You know, I, I've got. Uh, uh, some some plastic tubs that I can put alcohol in it, and I can do a, a, a dirty wash, a clean wash, a water wash, uh, and then you can buy a string of 405 nanometer LEDs and put them in a, a, a can of some kind and just use that to expose the parts. And I did both of those initially. And uh, what I discovered was, was that I was spending a lot of time doing that, that I would rather be doing something else. I can put the parts in this and just you know, I can do something else as these things are processing. Um, they're relatively inexpensive in comparison to the price of the printers. Uh, the, you know, the printers are, are running uh, low 200s. Uh, this thing, uh, Anycubic just had a sale. I think they were selling them for $119. And uh, yeah, for, for me, it was a good investment because it saved time. So what can I do with this? So we talked about the process and it's, it's uh, I, I appreciate the indulgence, but I thought it was important to kind of tell you where it came from and tell you, uh, here's what this overall thing looks like. It's not just, I'm gonna buy a printer and I'm gonna start making amazing things. Uh, you can use it to make amazing things, but there's a lot of other pieces to it. So, but what can you do? And um, I mentioned that first model that, that with the, the hand-built corbels that drove me to this. And this is the, the, the next building I did after this. And these were the first uh, things that I printed. Uh, these, uh, this uh, cornice here, uh, the, these uh, corbels are actually integral with the cornice. This is all one piece here, just as an experiment. But I also printed off some sheets like this. And this is, this is basically, uh, it's like a parts fruit. And so you've got the little, the, the stringers here, you've got the corbels here. Um, and, uh, and so this is where they ended up. I also printed off this 
fine. And again, I suppose you, you could scratch build this, but getting getting it perfectly symmetric and getting this even, uh, I, I would submit would be a, a fairly stringent challenge. And I think Walter, Walters does a sign kit that has something similar to this, but I was able to, to, uh, to design this and, and print it out and that all of these parts printed uh, within about an hour. So it really wasn't uh, too terribly hateful uh, time delay. Um, one of the other things you can do is, is if you want to do some, some kit bashing, and I had this uh, set, uh, Seaport Models, uh, it was a, a drag fishing trawler, and I wanted to convert it to a, a, a small freighter, uh, but a freighter would need an onboard derrick crane. So I did some quick research in the derrick crane design and, and said, okay, well, I can build those parts. So I went back into Fusion and I designed the, uh, the monkey face here, which is a, a, a swivel for, for the derrick and plus this, uh, plus this uh, uh, pulley here, pulleys on the deck. There's a winch motor on the deck. Uh, another pulley, uh, it's actually right there, more pulleys right here. The, uh, the, the spider uh, cast right here, which is, has got the, uh, the, uh, the uh, fittings for the stay line and these two uh, jib lines, the head block, all of these things were 3D printed. Um, and, and again, if I need to scale them, I, they're very easy to scale. Um, uh, and, uh, and that's what I, because man, it wasn't, uh, because this, this piece was a part of the kit, this piece was part of the kit, and most of the scaling problem had to do with getting the, the holes on the, the uh, fittings right so that they would fit over the pre-existing parts. It probably would have been easier and faster if I just replaced all of this with uh, 3D printed parts, uh, and that way I didn't have to try to fit what I was already there. But, you know, there you go. But it was, you know, something that was, Again, a, a something of an exercise in how fine of a detail can you get uh, with these components and, and what the, the mechanical strength was for for these things. Um, exterior details. This is another uh, building that I put together. Uh, I showed you an image of the uh, the uh, HL and thirty passenger cars that I was working on. This is the actual the first print I did of this. And it didn't work out terribly well because on the back side of this, I had a big hole in the casting where uh, I, don't, I don't recall whether it ran out of resin, but there was a big problem with it. But this side was fine. And so I had this, the image of the prototype laying around and I said, okay, well, I know what I'm going to do with that, that bit of the casting that did come out okay. Uh, these, uh, this car repair ramp, uh, again, designed up in, in, uh, in uh, Fusion, uh, the, the cinder block chimney. The, uh, the, I wanted that the original uh, image of this had 1950 styles pumps, uh, but I'm in 1938. And so I went online, found a, a drawing for this, uh, transferred it over into Fusion. And uh, if there's anybody there that wants a, a Tokheim 850, uh, I've got a whole, uh, whole uh, box full of these things. One of the nice things about this, and the NMRA uh, recognized this, uh, maybe maybe you know exactly how long ago it was, but it's been a while, but this NMRA saw this the, the 3D printing coming. And so they decided, okay, well, this is a tool like any other tool you're using to create something. And as long as you design the parts yourself and your CAD program and print them, um, yeah, they're considered a scratch built part. So this is all board on board siding, uh, board on, yeah, it's, it's all stick built. There's no uh, scribe siding in this, this model at all. Uh, but the window sashes are 3D printed. Uh, the skylights are 3D printed. This door track is 3D printed. Because, yeah, so again, I can, ar I can argue successfully that this is a 100% scratch built structure, no commercial parts whatsoever. Um, this, this one over here, this uh, fire station, uh, again, I could scratch build this. This would be a little bit harder though. 
And so what I ended up doing is this entire piece here ended up being a single piece that I, that I drew up uh, to match the prototype figure. Uh, I also put some additional cornice details in here uh, to extend beyond what this, this gable was. Uh, remember that, uh, that dental molding that I had put together uh, for one of the earlier pictures? Well, this is a, a more sophisticated with uh, a, a fairly complex uh, cross section on this piece here. Uh, in the, the bay doors, I started to scratch build these. Uh, I was happy with the, the basic frame of the door, but I was not happy with the way that I was getting the mullions done. So I just said, well, you know, I've got this 3D printer, I'm going to use it. Um, built the design and I was able to print, uh, design and print these four doors in less time than it took me to scratch build the, uh, the uh, first try at these. And then uh, interior details. And that, this, this, this next slide really shows you what the uh, level of detail that you can get with these uh, with this 3D printer. So this, these are the interior details for that fire uh, firehouse. And some of these are, are downloads uh, from Thingiverse. Some of these are built up in, in Fusion 360. But these chairs are a downloaded file. This was a file that pre-existed. Um, yeah, this desk was a file that pre-existed. The telephone, that's a HO scale coffee cup that is hollow. So, and again, that's something I was able to do on this printer. These uh, fireman boots here, you can see there and there, that's not a paint detail. These boots are hollow. And I don't know what the, the uh, thin cross section of these things are, but it's small. And uh, I've, I've got what, uh, six, 10 pair of boots there. I probably printed 20. And uh, these are, are the ones that came out because this, this cross, cross section is so thin, a lot of them collapsed or a, a, this, they, the print failed partway through or didn't work. But I was able to salvage about half of them and that, that's why there's 10 pair of boots here. So that's how many boots I ended up having. And that dictated how many fireman helmets I would use as well. Uh, the clothing rack, I actually, I scratch built one. I was not happy with the quality of it. So I went back into Fusion and built it up. And it's basically, there's, uh, it's all, you know, scale two inch piping, you know, around the perimeter there, uh, vertical. There's a uh, post here on either end, post in the center, a centerpiece and two supports for the shelf. Uh, and then the, the shelves themselves. Again, it took me probably about hour and out, maybe an hour and a half to do the design on that. And again, part of it was was finding the program and figuring out what it would what it would and would not do and how it wanted me to work. Um, but having done that, uh, I was able to print these off. And in the same amount of time it would have taken me to scratch build one, I was able to design and 3D print a dozen. Uh, and then the, this fire alarm, this is a, a little clunkier, but, but more than adequate. And you can just barely see it right here. Uh, the, uh, I mentioned this, uh, uh, SRRL uh, combine number of 11. So again, this is the 3D model of it. We we'll go through the print. And again, this, this is just uh, in, in progress. When it comes out, it looks like this. I mentioned the support. So here's, here's the, uh, the print bed here. You, you can just barely see the pads on the print bed. These are all the supports. And again, supporting this entire edge here, you can see uh, other supports here and like that, and then some more supports on the bottom. But when you, um, so you, you take this, you go take it through the two alcohol washes, and then a, 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 if you run it through a warm water wash, that softens the, the, the resin enough that these come off pretty cleanly. And all I've done between here and here is run it, you know, run it through that uh, warm water wash and basically snapped these sprues off 
you can still, there's one there, and uh, there's a couple of bits and pieces here uh, where you can say they didn't come off quite cleanly. But this is the kind of a, a product that you can get there. And uh, I think CarWorks did a brass version of, of number 11 a number of years ago, and you can still find it. Uh, and if you can, uh, I think they're running, uh, what, about $120 to $150 a piece if you can find them. But I've got, aside from my time, this is maybe $5 worth of uh, resin in these in this this car body and this floor. It's not, and, and again, there, there's uh, locomotives these are the uh, the Tommy uh, Monson uh, number fours that uh, he just came out with, and these are exquisite models. Uh, they are absolutely beautiful. Uh, I've got one on my workbench right now, and uh, it's it's going together beautifully. Uh, and that's that's a a commercial kit. But they, these are these other three pictures are things off the Facebook uh, 3D printing for model trains group, and so you can see this this is a uh, a uh, O scale, O four O. That looks. Uh, I'm not sure what the prototype is for that. It, it looks like uh, maybe Commodore Vanderbilt, but again, this is a 3D printed shell running on a commercial superstructure. And I'm, I was looking at this and I'm thinking, oh, I've always wanted to build a model of the Cincinnati and I, I, I can now build a model of the Cincinnati into the, the level of detail that I'm happy with. Um, and then these two little critters, and again, these are O scale, but just look at the detail on the, the seats and on the controls uh, on, on this lathe here. Uh, it's just absolutely exquisite the kinds of things you can do with these SLA printers. Uh, this is a, a quick model I built up. Um, but again, here's one of those chairs. Here's a cat that I got from uh, Mini Prints. Uh, Bernard Helen up in uh, Canada has a company, uh, look at miniprints.com. He's got some great wildlife uh, uh, figures that are available. These are some of the, actually, some of these are some of Bernard's. This is what turned me on to him is, you know, he had a flying pig and being from Cincinnati, you know, you know flying pig marathon. Uh, it's like, uh, the, I've got to have one of these because eventually I'm going to be done with these modules. And when it is, it's going to have a flying pig. Uh, uh, dogs, uh, these are uh, seagull castings that he does, uh, mallard ducks. Um, and again, and, and in terms of whimsy, this uh, this is a thing that I got off of Thingiverse. Uh, this the Snoopy on his doghouse, and that's HO scale. So even in an HO scale, I was able to print off and get his scarf. Uh, the orca I've been playing around with on and off for for since July. I'm getting reasonably happy with it. That's going to end up on uh, the modules at some point. Uh, you, and you can see this is the, the raw print. You can see the uh, little uh, bits here from the, uh, the uh, support screws here and here. But again, you know, need to put the, uh, the uh, fly deck on there and there's some additional detail on the back and then paint, paint it up. But, uh, but there's that. And then just for fun, my, my, uh, my son said, hey, dad, you got this 3D printer. Can you make me an arc reactor? And so, uh, you know, proof indeed that Tony Stark does have a heart. And again, this is all 3D printed with some LEDs to, uh, to light it up. It, uh, just, it, plugs into a, uh, it plugs into a standard uh, USB uh, plug. And again, just for whimsy. Yeah, you know, a, a 3D printed TARDIS that's uh, got an LED in it. It's uh, run by an Arduino that syncs up the, uh, the light and the sound. Hey, Ray, got a question here. Um, is there salvaging use for the resin supports that are broken off? 
Short answer is no. I mean, you, you could potentially use them in a scrapyard. I mean, they do look a lot like trusses, uh, but that's not something where you, you you can grind them up and reuse them. They're, they're basically, it's, it's uh, wasted. But like I said, I mean, it look, does look structural. So you know, putting them in the scrapyard somewhere might be a, a decent use for them. Okay. So I mentioned some of the references and, the, and these will be available. Um, I think you said you were recording this, weren't you, Terry? I managed to miss about the first four minutes, but I got everything else. Okay, so so this will be uh, this will be in the recording, and so you'll be able to uh, to go back to this. But I mentioned all three DP uh, before. This is a really useful site. Basically, it's every anything you might ever want to know about three D printing of any kind. Three uh, D printer universe is useful. Uh, I mentioned Thingiverse several times. Uh, this is like I said, this is my first stop. If I've I've got a model that uh, I want to uh, do. Uh, I, I'll every once in a while I'll buy a model because uh, again if I can if I need something and it's relatively inexpensive I bought a seagull model for like uh, eight dollars or something like that and it's a great investment because now I don't need to build a seagull model I can just download that one and I can print as many of them as I want um, so something you know, sometimes you need to make a a, a uh, a decision about how much is your time worth, how much is your your you know versus how much is are they asking for that particular model, uh, and then just go that way. Um, but there are a lot of free things out there. Um, Facebook model three D model trains group is really useful. And I'm gonna I'm gonna try to break off here because there's a and and go to a different. Thing. Uh, okay, so this is. Um, this is just an example of some of the things that are on there. And there are some files there, but people sharing their work and what they can do with the 3D printer. And the reason I wanted, wanted to come here is there's a guy who is modeling Cliff House in San Francisco. Ray, Ray, we're not, I'm not seeing that. Are we, oh, okay, you're all, okay, stand by. You're probably still set up. Okay, let me try this. There we go. How about now? Okay, so that's Cliff House in San Francisco. Uh, back in, uh, I think it was 1910, teens or something like that. Well, 19, early 1900s in any case. And so he is, yeah, This everybody's got kind of this defining model that you know people will remember them for. Uh, this is Kurtz. So he's building one of these. And he is, com uh, that is not Kurtz. This is Kurt. So he is combining laser cut pieces with 3D printed pieces to create that model. Uh, and uh, there's uh, other progress shots that he has further on. Uh, but this is just uh, an amazing piece of work. Um, here's a good one. So you can see the kinds of things he's, he's able to do with these. Um, and, and again, these are multiple pieces going on here. And he's combined it with the, the, the laser cut plywood. But it's, it's absolutely, the, the, the design of this and the execution is just absolutely uh, mind blowing. But think about, this could be scratch build, but how much time would it take you to build just one of these towers, let alone six? And the same thing here. Yeah, you, you, you could do this by building a master and then casting it in resin uh, the, the old fashioned way. But uh, the 3D printing, uh, you can print as many of these finials as you, you might possibly want. So it becomes a not just a question of, of time, but the ability to get consistent detail uh, and execute a project like this. Um, again, just absolutely stunning. So we're gonna go back here. And the, the other thing I did about this the, with that, that 3D Facebook group is I asked them, you know, I'm gonna do this presentation and but what is it that you wish you had known 
starting out. Uh, so I, I wanted to get their feedback on this. And these are some of the questions, uh, some of the answers I got back. Um, and I, I mentioned this earlier, it is a revolutionary technology. Uh, you can do all kinds of amazing things, but I like the, this reference here. It's not replicator technology from Star Trek. You're not gonna be able to push a button, walk away and come back and have it. Uh, it requires care and feeding. It requires uh, practice with the different resins and, and, and the different printers, and they all interact differently. And, and figuring out the particular mix for what you have uh, does take a while, but it's extremely, extremely powerful. Uh, and at, at this point, uh, I, I literally cannot imagine being without it. It's one of the reasons when that thing broke right before Ch uh, Chinese New Year's, uh, that's why I ended up going out and buying a replacement is because you know, the thought of being without the, the use of that machine for six weeks, uh, I found unacceptable. Um, but uh, this is, this is a, a great kind of get off this, the stage uh, idea here. It's not going to replace the entire process. It is a, another tool. It can do things that you uh, can't do easily using other methods, uh, but you can do yeah, really amazing things. Um, you're never going to, I, I don't think, uh, get to the the point where you can do grain detail like you can with a, 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 a piece of uh, scribe siding or strip wood. Uh, that level of detail is, is still, I think, beyond it. Um, but for the different, for windows and finials and trim and you know, brickwork, custom brickwork, uh, detailed uh, concrete moldings. I, I live here in, uh, in London and the, the architectural detail on these structures, um, I've always admired uh, Victorian buildings. It's like, that's, that's absolutely incredible, but I cannot for the life of me fathom how to build that in HO scale. And now it's a not a question of can I build that? Uh, it's a question of how long will it take me to do it? And which one do I want to build? Because now literally the door is thrown wide open. I can do any of them. It's just a matter of, may have, of deciding which one I want to do. But again, I, at the, I, Pete's got I, a comment uh, he'd like to make at this point. Sure. Thank you, sir. If we can go back uh, easily to that shared slide where you had the engine house and the fire station. Sure. Because you did ask and you, uh, yeah, that one. Okay. <clears throat> so let's just assume for the sake of argument, the question is still on the floor. What is scratch built? What is not scratch built? And how do we, how do we know? So I've got my, my printer and everything set up and I'm all good to go and it isn't working. So I call Ray and say, hey, Ray, what up? And Ray comes over and he takes a look and he says, oh, well, here's where you screwed up your, co your code, you fool. You should have put in two extra slashes and three dots or whatever instead of the five. So we make the change and now all of a sudden my part comes out. Because Ray did the final code, he changed my code. That is now considered a commercial part by the NMRA. Now, I want to make all this stuff, but I don't have a 3D printer. So I get my programs together and I send everything to Shapeways. Same deal. They put my program into the machine. The machine spits out a part. That part comes back to me. That is a scratch built part. They put the thing into the machine. Doesn't work. And they look at it and say, oh, this idiot did this. So they change something that is now a commercial part. Now, for what it's worth, Shapeways isn't going to do that anymore because they got too much business. They can't spend the time doing it, but you get the idea. So we're looking at everything we've got here in the engine house is scratch built, no questions asked. Now we get into the fire station. Well, it's looking pretty good all the way. Whoop, wait a minute. What's that thing on the wall over there? Looks like a fire alarm, a gong maybe. That's where the tones were going off. Yeah, right there, right there. Yeah. that little gadget right there. You can't. You, you showed that a little bit further on down the line here, but that's a program that you down or something you downloaded and then printed. No, no, that one is not. However, the fire hats 
and yeah, everything yeah, else. Yeah, well, I'm going to get to those in yeah. a second. I'm just moving bay right. to bay here, I'm trying to go left to right, you know, like I read. Right. So, but so in any that, event, all that stuff in the bay that he's done really well with, um, that's all commercial, even correct. though he printed it because it's somebody else's code. And that's the whole deal with the idea of, well, do you or do you not um, know how to use the tool? Right. That's the same thing you get into with a screwdriver or a soldering iron or anything else. So with that, I'm loving this. And if you have extra fire boots, we need to talk. <laughs> Actually, if you have extra, uh, th those look almost like a Cairns New Yorker. That's the fire hat. Yeah, it may well be. Uh, there was not... It was well, not uh, we have extra, when I got ex, it. extra hats and boots that I need. We need to talk. Yeah, those are those are, are are really stupid easy to do, but but again, as you said, and that's why I put this on here. They count as AP scratch built if you do the CAD design work yourself. Yeah, because all it is is learning how to use a tool the same way you learn how to use this. This, by the way, is called a pen, and we used to use it for you know, marking and writing things and that kind of stuff. So, thank you. Right, great, great point. No worries. Um, okay. Again, and just like regular modeling, it's a, it's, it's a tool. Actually, you know, it's a, it's a suite of tools. It's the, the, uh, the CAD program, it's the slicer, and it's the, uh, and the printer itself. But Understanding what those things are and how to use them and what the limitations are uh, is, is what allows you to get to the point where literally you're, you're limited only by, by your, your imagination. Uh, go out and find those prototypes that you always admired but never thought you'd be able to build. Using te this technology, I bet you're going to be able to do those. And with that, Want to close it up. Any other questions? I'm here all night. Try the veal, tip your weight staff. Got a question. Sure. The point that Pete just brought up. When you're down to getting things judged, how are you able to be able to prove that you're the only one that wrote the code to make the part? Well, again, how, how is it that you're able to prove that any part on a, on a building or car or locomotive is scratch built as opposed to um, as opposed to, to purchased or built or designed yourself and, and cast yourself? Because again, you could uh, use a resin casting and it counts as scratch built if you built the master. But how do you know? that you built the master. And, and so there's a certain level of trust uh, that is involved there. Uh, again, you don't know, but at some point you need, you need to take, uh, take the word of the modeler at his word. It's called okay. ethics. Yeah. I mean, would the, would the modeler have to sit down and maybe possibly prove to them that they can actually really do this? Maybe, you know, they throw a, no? Probably no, not. I, no, no. Do, you prove, do you have to prove that you know how to use a, uh, a uh, Ruffler file or an X-Acto <laughs> knife? It's the same thing. It's a tool. Yeah. And, and I, I think that's a dangerous slope I wouldn't want to get involved with. <laughs> yeah, I know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ray. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Ray. Yep. Hey. Yay. Hey, Gary. Oh, by the way, there is a, a series in the current issues of uh, Railroad Model Craftsman, also on 3D printing, too, which uh, I'm glad I had read it before I watched this because it what Ray has provided here filled in some gaps that was missing from the article I was reading and, and explained a few things for me. So it's a good compliment to read the, read the that is a print source as well as what you mentioned with the uh, places to look for on the, on the web. Yeah. Well, and, and the other thing is, you know, 
this this technology, as I showed in the timeline, it's really only been around for five or six years. The, the, this, these SLA printers that are, that are relatively inexpensive and, and you can get. Um, the mono LED technology has really just emerged within the last six months. Uh, the other thing that's emerged is because there, the, the uh, LCD masks that are used uh, to, to uh, create the, 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 uh, the image on the, uh, on the VAT, they use, uh, they use a cell phone uh, technology to do that. And so there's an economy of scale there. And so what you end up with is the reason all of these things end up are, are about the same size is because they're, they're using the same cell phone hardware. Uh, for that LCD mask, and and so they're all, they're all you know roughly five and a half inches uh, you know on, on the diagonal. The new generation of printer, so we got the monochromes now, and then that's all stuff behind the mask. The next generation that's coming out now, and uh, the the Elegoo Saturn and the uh, Creality LD006 and the um, any cubic uh, photon uh, X, they use a bigger LCD. And so they, they've got a bigger print size. And if you go back to the, the, the slide that shows the comparison between them, uh, it's like four or five times the volume in some of these newer machines than, than are in the, the generation that is, uh, was immediately preceded and they're monochrome, and rather than 2K resolution, they're 4K resolution. So all of these things are continuing to improve. Now the machine that I bought, the, the, the uh, Creality machine I just bought here in February, um, it's not obsolete, but for rather than spending, uh, I think I, I spent uh, $250 or so on it, uh, for 500, I can get one with four times the volume at this point. And that's just happened within the last two months. And so where is this technology going to end up in a year or two years or three years? Uh, it, it's, it's mind blowing uh, how fast it's changing and the prices are coming down. The, the machine that I bought last July has come down in price by a third just in that time. So this, this, it's a, it's an interesting time to get involved with it. And, and if you have any interest at all, and if you have the, 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 the you know, two or $300 to invest in it, it's worth an experimentation uh, just to see what you can do with it. 